Welcome everybody and thank you for coming. On behalf of the University of York and the Stockholm Environment Institute, may I welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Professor John Whiteleg. Um, I'm Tricia Sloper, I'm Academic Coordinator for Social Science at the University. Unfortunately, the Vice Chancellor is not able to be with us um, right now, so I'm standing in. Um, John Whiteleg was born in Oldham in Lancashire and he studied geography at the University College of, University College of Wales, Aberystwyth. And he stayed there for six years, um, enjoying the delights of Aberystwyth and the sea, I hope. Um, on the way, he got his geography degree and a PhD in the spatial analysis of manufacturing activity. He then embarked on a long journey through the varied landscape of transport. Um, that included mathematical modelling of the growth in demand for freight transport, the logistic systems of steel manufacturing and transport, um, running ferry and air services, uh, responsibility for seaweed processing and tweed manufacturing, and economic development in the Outer Hebrides, a really interesting and varied set of um, research. He then began teaching and researching on transport at Lancaster University, um, moving from a lectureship in 1977 to professorship and head of department in 1993. John has worked on sustainable transport projects for 30 years, which is a long time before many of us realised the importance, I would think, of sustainable transport. He's the author of 10 books and over 100 papers. He's worked extensively on consultancy and research projects for UK local authorities, the European Commission, the Australian Government, and many private sector clients. Uh, he's also worked extensively in China and India, including projects to produce transport strategies for Calcutta and Beijing. John came to York in 2001, and his recent projects include the York Intelligent Travel Project, which produced a 16% reduction in car trips in the target group. He's also on the team bringing the 10th International Towards Car Free Cities Conference to York in 2010. He's professor at the Stockholm Environment Institute at York and visiting professor of sustainable transport at Liverpool John Moores University. He also edits World Transport Policy and Practice, the journal he founded in 1995, and he runs the consultancy Ecologica. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor John Whiteleg to deliver the lecture Energy and Equity, a Beginner's Guide good, to designing zero carbon transport system. Thank you. Thank you very much for those kind words of introduction and it's an enormous pleasure to be able to do this in the University of York and to share some of my ideas uh, with an audience, an audience as varied as the one here this evening. The subject, I think, it gets more important day by day, and even though it's something I've been working on for longer than I would care to remember, it's also a subject where there's a lot more work to be done in transmitting and translating what we're doing in a research sense into actual implementation. And before I begin, there's just one thought I'd like you to sort of ponder on a little bit, which is that currently the global population of motor vehicles is about, nobody knows exactly how many, about 750 million motorized vehicles on the planet. Uh, many organizations, but especially one German forecasting organization, has predicted that this will rise to 2.3 billion by 2030. So we're actually looking at a transport system that is developing in a way that certainly goes against the grain of almost everything that we've been taught to think is correct in terms of reducing impacts, improving air quality, reducing road traffic accidents and dealing with climate change. So what we're trying to do in a transportation research sense and in the Stockholm Environment Institute is get to grips with these issues and see what we can do to design a zero carbon transport future. And we'll see how we get on this evening and whether you think it is a good idea and feasible. And I've just broken the system. <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh -huh. Yes, I have. Uh, the Stockholm Environment Institute, uh, I'm not going to read this out, but you have to have a mandatory advertisement, uh, is a global science policy institute with a considerable emphasis on not only doing the science well, but converting the science into actual 
policy and implementation involving communication and media work and working from, with citizens right the way up to United Nations organizations and other global organizations. The, the plan that I want to work through in the next uh, 30, 35 minutes is to look at some of the trends that are actually causing us a lot of concern, us being not only a research community, a scientific community, but a policy-making community, to note that things are getting worse, uh, in passing to note that most of our policy, uh, if it's really, really successful, will achieve making it get worse slightly more slowly than it might otherwise, but it will still get worse. And most policymaking shares the behavioural characteristics of the rabbit caught in the headlights of a passing car. Increasingly, the transport policy community, and this is not as rude as I can be, I'm going to be on my best behaviour this evening, uh, the transport policy community shares the DNA with rabbits uh, running down the middle of a road dealing with the headlights of passing cars, and, uh, and that's not very much of an exaggeration. And the interesting thing is, even though there's a great deal of uh, kind of unpleasant consequences from the scale of motorization I'm going to be talking about, the solution, the way forward, the actual uh, things we can do on a practical level are dead easy. And there is no problem at all in implementing things, but there is a nervousness and a worry about doing so. So first of all, the, uh, the, the things are getting worse part of, of the presentation. I'm not going to talk about any of these slides in great detail, but I, I am going to make some incredibly uh, scientific remarks like uh, all these problems are graphs starting in the bottom left-hand corner and going up to the top right-hand corner. And, uh, and whether we're looking at energy demand, uh, passenger transport growth in, uh, freight transport growth, and, and motor vehicle population ownership, motor vehicle use, the fact that one research organization in the United States thinks that the target uh, travel distance per person per annum is 270,000 kilometers a year. Uh, that's, that's taking into account the fact we all travel for 1.1 hours a day. The average speed at which we travel is going up and up and up. The population of the planet is going up and up and up. And all transport policy is aimed at repeating these graphs, bottom left to top right. So that's world energy demand with oil, the red line at the top. Uh, by the way, a lot of these things are from the International Energy Agency. So I want to acknowledge what this uh, is also from the IEA. So personal transport, that is people moving around. And you see there the, the, the trends are once again the same. This is up to 2050. Uh, trillions, I, I, I find it difficult to imagine what a trillion looks like. Trillions of passenger kilometers. Basically, things are increasing very rapidly. Most of us are moving around far more. If we live in places like China and India, we're also starting to move around far more. Encouraged, by the way, by things like the Chinese government that have decided to commit a significant amount of budgetary expenditure on road construction, other forms of transport as well, but mainly road, and have reallocated agricultural land away from growing food towards roads on the basis that they can cancel out the capacity to grow food to feed 70 million, 70 million people per annum and to use it for roads instead. The Chinese government made an explicit policy commitment to deleting agricultural capacity that would feed 70 million people and reallocating it to roads. And that's not being rude about the Chinese government. It's the same in other parts of the world. So personal mobility, personal movement, the ability to travel further, faster, more often, use more space and reallocate space. That is the norm. This is what we're dealing with. That's personal transport. This is mode. In other words, car, air, two, three wheelers, buses, minibuses and so on. And of course, on there, we don't have walking and cycling. I'll be coming back to some aspects of uh, walking and cycling later on, those tend to be in decline. And again, in China, as in India, I've been involved with the state of West Bengal, uh, trying to persuade them not to ban the cycle rickshaw, which they did ban in Calcutta. Uh, the, the country of Bangladesh banning cycle rickshaws in <coughs> Dhaka. So there is a move uh, in most parts of the world to downgrade walking and cycling whilst talking up walking and cycling as a sustainable mode, a zero carbon mode, a healthy mode. But in the meantime, road space is reallocated away from those modes. So motorised transport is increasing. Uh, worldwide transport related fuel use, uh, same graph, almost all the graphs are identical. and You will already, already have sussed out that it's the same graph put in 10 different ways. 
uh, trillions of litres of gasoline equivalent going up, transport-related well-to-wheel CO2 emissions by mode, so there you see carbon dioxide, uh, gigatons, billion tons of CO2 equivalent, and that is in, in its turn going up similarly from around 6 gigatons in the year 2000 to somewhere approaching 15 in the year 2050. And by the way, there isn't enough fuel around to maintain that growth trajectory, something else I come back to later. By region, you can see how China is developing and the OECD North America and so the regional breakdown of those growth trajectories is also important and giving a great deal of concern in terms of climate change, resource allocation, global poverty eradication, food production, because as I'm trying to uh, explore in this talk, transport is not as boring as most people think it is. It actually relates to things like quality of life, air quality, respiratory disease, obesity, and the ability to grow food. Okay. Um, I'm not responsible for the rude word in the middle of that slide, but I thought I would leave it there just the same. Um, this is from a colleague of mine, Professor Knoflacker in the Technical University of Vienna. Uh, this essentially is the uh, main transport policy trajectory around the world. I don't think we've got one of those within 10 kilometres of where we are this evening, uh, but if you add up the amount of road space that's been added in Britain over the last two or three decades, it is fairly significant. And this idea that we can continue to build very expensive, very space-consuming uh, infrastructure to increase levels of mobility and presumably to support what is increasingly regarded as a flawed model of economic development is one of the core arguments that we're trying to uh, restate, restructure, in the sense that what we want to do is to move towards a better allocation of resources, less space-consuming, less uh, time-consuming, which these things are as well. So transport infrastructure is related in a very precise scientific sense to the spread of urban civilization across the face of the earth, and the more of this we get, the more we spread out where we live, where we work, what we do, and produce the problems that we are quite familiar with. So the next bit of the presentation is just to show you some pretty slides. You all know this is the case, but I want to make the point that one of the many underestimated, underappreciated, under-researched aspects of transport is space, space consumption, land consumption. Uh, we tend to talk a lot about road safety, death and injury on the roads, uh, increasingly more about air pollution and noise, food capacity, food production capacity, but we are, we are colonising our urban space and increasingly our rural space with things like this. Auto-dependent sprawling cities all over the world. There are many interesting studies of the, the degree to which North America differs from Australia and from Germany and from the UK and, and the energy intensity of different arrangements in terms of land use. And basically, you know the answer anyway, that the more we have large amounts of urban sprawl, long distances over which people travel and commute by private motorised transport, the more we have high levels of energy consumption, fuel use, and the thing feeds itself and goes round and round and round to produce more demand for car parking, and more demand for yet more roads, more demand to deal with congestion. So the City of York Council are very unkindly meeting this evening deliberately to clash with my talk and they're talking about how to sort out traffic congestion in York. And in those kind of discussions, you see the confusion. I'm not saying York, the City of York Council is confused. It's a global confusion uh, that building more road space helps to reduce or alleviate congestion, and in fact, it very, very rarely, if ever, does that. If you live in a small village in North Yorkshire with 300 people and you build a bypass, it probably will help, but apart from that, it doesn't help any major cities. Australian cities are, are very interesting places, high level of awareness of sustainability, high level of development of things related to sustainable futures. They're very interested in local food production, permaculture, a whole number of things, but they, they have some kind of genetic predisposition towards spreading things out over very, very, very large distances. And Adelaide and Perth are, are massively spread out over, say, 100 kilometres in each direction. Los Angeles is the favourite example of all transport planners. Hong Kong is at the other end of the scale, very, very, very densely populated, very high levels of use of public transport. Asian cities, very, very high density, low energy consumption, 
per capita because of that, but very severe problems in terms of time loss and congestion in moving around. Uh, the trend globally towards decentralised car-based work locations and indeed hospital education and so on is feeding the problem so that more and more and more we become uh, motorised uh, transport dependent high energy uh, users and unable to see a way out of this uh, vicious cycle of land use and transport change. Low density inevitably means vast road networks. That's the way cities in North America and Australia and now quite extensive suburbs of British cities have developed. The ubiquitous business park, science park, usually with a large pond with a few ducks on it so that you can act and a, and a large, I won't, name, I won't name and shame any, one university, not York, one university is developing a science park for 1,100 staff with 1,000 car parking places and has produced a sustainable transport plan because it says there's a bus stop on the A6. And, uh, and uh, there is a bus there, they think, every hour. So, um, you know, th this tends to produce this kind of problem in terms of a extra uh, spreading of trips and energy consumption. The space side is incredibly important. The diagram there in the bottom left is, is something that uh, one can repeat in many parts of the world. That's simply looking at a typical... <laughs> Cloverleaf Junction, and it occupies exactly the same area as a typical medieval walking city such as Salzburg. Uh, the Autobahn Kreuz, the German motorway junctions, which tend to follow, even though Germany has some uh, claim to have a higher level of sustainability in transport than Britain, the, the motorway junctions in Germany uh, tend to occupy as much land as would be occupied by, uh, say, 20,000 people in, in their homes, one university and, uh, and one large hospital. They're very space greedy in terms of their, their land requirements and they produce the effect that then we try and deal with uh, when we say we want to design a low carbon, zero carbon or sustainable transport system. Congestion is a problem almost in every part of the world, almost every city. The City of York Council are fundamentally frustrated and annoyed and grumpy about congestion in York and, and yet are unable, up to this evening, unable to do anything about it. And we'll see what comes out of it uh, after this evening. The, uh, the provision of parking places in Melbourne, in Detroit, in Chicago, uh, and high quality transport infrastructure exacerbates the problem, makes it worse, and makes the long-term solution more difficult to arrive at. There are health problems. Los Angeles used to be smog central, but has now been overtaken by some developing cities, such as Mexico City. We still get lots of smog. We still get lots of uh, ozone pollution. We still get lots of uh, respiratory problems related to particulate emissions, hospital admissions and deaths in the world cities. So there's a fairly gloomy catalogue of nasties that we're trying to do something about. I hasten to add we're going to get to the point very, very soon where we will uh, elaborate what can be done about it and it is not difficult to do. But I want to try and bring these points together now by saying, OK, uh, we know a little bit about space, we know a little bit about time, we know a little bit about uh, road traffic accidents. Uh, I agree with the World Health Organisation, by the way, that we should never use the word accident. Road traffic accidents are not accidents, they're entirely predictable and they're entirely preventable. The World Health Organization takes a view that most road safety practitioners do not take, that there's no such thing as a non-predictable, non-preventable death and serious injury. They're all predictable, they're all preventable. Broken bodies, air pollution, oil, a brief digression into global warfare. Okay, space. Cars take up a lot of space. Uh, I'm a great admirer of uh, German ways of portraying what, what I'm now talking about. They're very good at showing identifiable streets. And if you had whatever it is, 100 people or whatever, you can show how much space will be occupied by those people if they were in cars, if they were on bicycles, if they were on foot, if they were in some other kind of form of transport. And it very quickly becomes apparent that if one is dealing, certainly with a European city, it is actually pretty dumb to make a fundamental assumption that we should try and get 20, 30, 40,000 people through our streets a day with one person in one car, or even 1 1.4, 1 1.5 people in one car. 
One of the many interesting aspects of British transport planning is that average vehicle occupancy, to use one of the many boring transport statistical indicators, average vehicle occupancy goes down over time. So we get a, we get a greater level of demand for space because fewer of us are sharing cars. We prefer to use a car with one person in that car. Uh, there are several hypotheses about the fact that this is because we're increasingly miserable and grumpy and antisocial and unfriendly and we don't want to share anything with anybody, but that's another story. Getting people out of cars where it is appropriate, where it is feasible, where there is a congested city, where there are air quality problems, where there are road safety problems, is entirely reasonable, entirely explicable. It's, it's easy to do, but most cities around the world, are, we're back to the DNA of rabbits, are very, very, very very uneasy about doing what should be done. So we can liberate a lot of space. This is one of my favourite diagrams and I always feel a little bit um, uh, uh, uneasy because I can't uh, talk to you for five minutes about each line on the graph. There is no time. Uh, let me just show you, and you can see it already I hope, what's happening in this, in this particular graph. Uh, the relationship between mode of transport, speed at which we travel and space requirement is fundamental. I am a geographer by training, and if you really want to be bored and never invited to cocktail parties, talk to a geographer and pick up space-time sort of arguments, because we can be, and I am, incredibly boring about space and time. Basically, if you want to organise a city so that you waste loads of time and loads of space and create a very unpleasant, antisocial, unfriendly environment, you would end up doing something like the car, if you skip down one, two, three, four five, six, or whatever. The car with one person at 40 kilometers per hour, with the big red blob on the, on the right-hand side there that says that person needs 60 square meters. Right? In other words, speed at which you travel because of distance between vehicles is related to space that is occupied. Uh, if we have a city that is uh, largely functioning with lots of people walking and cycling, like at the top there, uh, the pedestrian needs 0.8 square metres per person, and I don't think anyone's done the sums about how that changes if the pedestrian goes at 40 kilometres per hour. I don't, think, I don't think they do that. And the cyclist needs 3 square metres per person, and you begin to construct a way of looking at the way in which space, land, should be allocated in cities. And that goes down to the bottom of the diagram there, looking at buses and metros and trains and other such things. We need to put space at the centre of our thinking so we can design attractive cities. And speed is also a very interesting uh, concept in transport planning that tends not to be followed through in terms of detailed planning from an engineering or implementation point of view because of the idea of effective speed or social speed. It comes in different ways. And effective speed or social speed is basically saying that speed, we're going to look at speed for a moment and we're going to see how speed varies according to how much time we're allocating to carrying out particular kinds of journeys. And you know all this, time and speed. Okay. But, going back to the work of Illich in the early 1970s, and other people, including a colleague of mine, Paul Tranter, in, in Canberra, in Australia, looking at social speed, what you need to do to understand transport impacts fully and the power of restructuring space and time in world cities is actually start including the money that we need to earn to spend on our cars in the calculation about speed. And that, this idea, amazingly, was first introduced in 1854 and then was uh, very finely developed by, by the work of Ivan Illich in Energy and Equity, and that's an excellent book, still worth reading. And Illich produced this particular um, conclusion at the time, that the typical American male devotes more than 1,600 hours a year to his car. He spends four of his 16 waking hours on the road or gathering his resources for it. So basically, we, we want to run around in a car. We have to pay the cost of car ownership, car use. We have to work to do that. that we have to put that money into it, and that then gets factored into the, the speed. So the average, the model American, as Illich says, uh, actually gets effective speed of five miles per hour. Now, of course, 
uh, if, if we're talking to the RAC or the AA or, or, or some other organisation, they, they find this ridiculous. But in terms of linking fiscal uh, issues to spatial issues and time issues and urban design issues, this becomes quite important. And it's actually becoming very important now in Australian cities, which are in fiscal crisis for a number of reasons, but fiscal crisis because they have extensive suburbs with relatively low-income people owning cars and driving cars in extensive suburbs, and those people are in deep distress as fuel prices rise. So ideas of effective speed become particularly important in understanding how to create a fairer society and how to make it work well. Another aspect of a fairer society that I again think is massively underplayed, underestimated, and should be factored into all public policy making and decision taking is to do with how far children can move around and travel. Uh, I did a project on this with Mayor Hillman and John Adams in the early 1990s, published in a book called One False Move and You're Dead. And the de a very catchy title, I hope you'll agree. <laughs> and the Department for Transport got very angry with us because that was the title of a road safety campaign. Uh, the point is, is very elementary, that if you look at that diagram, for example, you'll see that the very big, funny-shaped area there around Sheffield is the air area over which an eight-year-old could walk and move around and do things on their own without adult company, without a car, without anything, in 1919. And if we go to uh, somewhere uh, in the top left-hand corner there, we have slightly smaller areas, considerably smaller areas, where children are now not allowed to do anything. So in the top left there, you see Ed, now eight, is only allowed to walk on his own to the end of his street. We, we have uh, Vicky, aged about eight in 1979, was allowed to walk to the swimming pool alone half a mile away. The point emerging from this work is, is deeply significant, and it's that our transportation systems and other things, there is a debate about whether this is a stranger danger issue as well. That's a very intense debate in transport. Do we stop our children moving around in, in uh, an urban area, for example, because of transport worries and road safety, or because everyone is terrified that there is some very serious person going to murder them or something at the end of the street. And that is a debate that goes on. But we have seen in a matter of three decades in this country the termination of the ability of children to walk and cycle and explore. And our psychology colleagues that we work with on transport matters tell us that that has enormous and negative implications for cognitive skills, spatial ability, and interestingly, given my concerns about DNA and rabbits, it stops us solving problems. We don't solve problems very well if our life is a kind of a movement, a very small distance movement between the television and computer, the car and the school and another car trip, and another. We, we don't have the spatial ability or the cognitive skills. We have to understand how space and place and fairness and the ability to move around and accessibility and quality of life actually mean a great deal to the future of civilization, and that's not underestimating it. Broken bodies gets very serious at this point, and it's a source of immense concern globally. Uh, 3,000 people die on the roads of the world every day. 1.2 million uh, annually. 85% of these deaths are in low and middle income countries. Um, I've done transport projects in Calcutta, and in Calcutta, they don't know, they can't count them very well, but they think about 1,000 pedestrians a year are killed in Calcutta. 96% of child deaths are in low and middle income countries. 20 to 50 million, very difficult to quantify, injured or disabled each year. And even though the economics is a bit uh, wobbly and suspect, it is possible to put a, a price on all this mayhem, and it's over $500 billion per annum. We really do need to sort out the degree to which our global transport systems are basically killing our own species, are systematically massacring our own species. The ability to drive a car for a couple of miles and buy a packet of cigarettes or a pint of milk is of a higher significance in public policy making than the threat that represents to many people who live on streets with heavy traffic or simply want to go around on their bicycles or on foot. A lot of that debate then is about speed. So we're back to speed and time and effective speed. And again, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but the percent chance of surviving, if we had every street 
in York or Leeds or wherever, uh, properly controlled at 20 miles per hour. And so that's like no deviation. You know, a big sign outside Leeds at all possible points of entry and outside York saying, this is a 20 mile per hour city, get lost if you don't like it, we don't want you. It's 20 mile per hour, don't even think about 22 miles per hour. And the reason for doing that is sound epidemiology, sound, it's science. The science says you have a 95% chance of surviving if you're hit by a car at, as a pedestrian at that speed. And that goes, as you see there, 45 and 5. So if you hit at 40, mile, 40 miles per hour, you have a 5% chance of surviving. Road safety and the probability of death and injury on the road is a fantastic area which is a no-go area for science. If you're a scientist, do not get involved in road safety. We're not interested. It's, the speed limit's 30 miles per hour. We don't care about data. And by the way, if you go at 36 miles per hour, it's still all right. We do not use science. There's lots of, and th this is what I mean by science. Lots of studies of this kind, World Health Organization. If you have a 10% reduction in speed, you will produce something like a 10% a reduction or more in, in fatalities. You can actually go up and down the curves and produce your own calculations there. The World Health Organization says road traffic crashes. They prefer that terminology, not accident. Road traffic crashes are predictable and therefore preventable. In order to combat the problem, though, there needs to be a close coordination and collaboration using holistic and integrated approaches across many sectors and many disciplines. The problem is rabbits in highways don't do holistic and integrated approaches. So, now, this then comes to another interesting point in terms of a wider political, philosophical future of society, use of science debate. Um, we seem to like things that go very fast. I recently got into a lot of trouble by arguing that high-speed trains are bad. I won't even go into the details of that. They're bad in the sense that they produce higher levels of carbon dioxide emissions and they encourage us all to travel further and faster more frequently. But is it practicable, is it possible, can we argue that going slow is, is a good idea? And of course, from a political and a policy point of view, slow is a kind of a bad word. You know, it doesn't really ring the sort of bells that politicians and economists like. I mean, the whole of economics, if you, if you do transport economics, which I used to teach and then gave up because it was making me very unhappy, if, if you teach transport economics, you have to get to grips with the fact that saving time is a large positive asset. It's a large value in an economic calculation. If you want to build a road around York, the Treasury and the Department for Transport set a very complicated cost-benefit analysis procedure to enable us to calculate whether or not building a road around York is a good idea. If you want to build a road around York and it will generate lots of extra traffic and lots of extra pollution, it's a good idea in a cost-benefit analysis because it will use a lot more fuel and that means a lot more taxation is paid to government so it has a large positive value. If you want to build a tram in Leeds or York or something like that and the calculations show that it will remove people from cars, reduce the number of cars, reduce pollution, reduce CO2 emissions, it has a lower value because it produces a loss of revenue to government in terms of taxation. So economics and language and philosophy end up giving us a problem. This book is particularly interesting because it's in praise of slow across a whole number of different subject areas. You'll be very happy to hear, I'm not going to elaborate on these subject areas, I once gave a lecture to a group of transport students about the relationship between slow food, slow sex and slow transport and they started leaving the room. So I'm not, and all I was doing was copying from this, this person uh, about the, because the, there are some interesting interconnections between those three areas but this is not part of my inaugural lecture. So how do we promote the advantages of slow? Is slow good or is slow bad? Uh, it's a little bit like the English language when you start talking about traffic calming and you start talking about designing streets. I frequently challenge audiences, so I'll give it a try this evening, uh, of giving me an English word that sounds good, that conveys the idea that lots of people will hang about on a street and have a nice time talking to each other. Uh, because all the English words I can think of, lingering, hanging about, doing, you know, they're, they're all kind of negative. 
whereas if you look at street design in a German city or a Dutch city or a Danish city and you see lots of uh, uh, attempts, evidence, lots of investment in encouraging people to linger, uh, then you see there's a different way of thinking about things and those other languages have nice words for lingering. So we have to move from fast, greedy, energy-intensive, frequent, high-speed, high-distance consumption towards something at the slow end. But how do we package that? How do we market it? How do we describe it? Well, one way that we have found is Donald Appleyard's uh, classic study in San Francisco in 1981 in his book, Livable Streets. Now, to cut a long story very short, what Donald Appleyard did is actually go into specific streets in, in San Francisco and identify the traffic flow per day, which you see there, uh, categorise as heavy, medium, light, and then do the kind of survey work that would make social scientists in this audience a bit green about the gills, I think, uh, which is to say, how many friends have you got? And how many acquaintances have you got? And apparently, I've not done it myself, there is a reasonably robust methodology uh, for working this out. And on a heavily trafficked street, the people have, the residents have 0.9 friends per person and 3.1 acquaintances. And you go down to the bottom and they've, in the lightly trafficked street, and they've got three friends per person and 6.3 acquaintances per person. Now, classic social science here, what's cause, what's effect, what are we talking about, what's going on? Uh, when I taught transport to undergraduates many years ago, one very smart guy, who I'm glad to say got a third-class degree when he left the university, <laughs> said that's because sad, miserable people choose to live on heavily trafficked streets. And, and there's, it's a very interesting social science point, this, actually. Uh, that, in other words, it was nothing to do with the hypothesis I was trying to explain. <laughs> that if you live on a heavily trafficked street, you're frightened, you're nervous, you don't go out, you don't, you don't hang about on the street, you don't actually know your neighbours, you hide in a back room, you, you don't socialise. On a lightly, tra lightly trafficked street, you do. So he turned that the other way round. Interestingly, another uh, person has recently done a study of this kind in Bristol, and, and that's been published and is available on the internet, replicating the work of Donald Appleyard in San Francisco. The point is, do we want streets that are traffic sewers, or do we want streets that give elderly people, people who can't move very fast, slow people, maybe we've got slow people, uh, children that give people a pleasant, rewarding, nurturing experience? Or do we regard our streets as something to shove masses of traffic down to produce air pollution and noise and every now and then kill somebody? You know, what is the purpose of a street? And that, again, is a serious argument we're not really getting into. I'll speed up a little bit through the health, because I think the evidence base on the relationship between traffic and health, especially air pollution and obesity, is now largely known. I'll pause on this one because I've tried this on some of our, over the past 20 years, on some of our ministers of transport in this country. Uh, what this research draws upon is a number of different studies in different parts of the world, which is about the exposure of individuals on different modes of transport to air pollution. So, for example, if you're sitting in a car, <clears throat> what is your exposure to carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and then really nasty things like benzene, toluene, and xylene? And all the research points to the fact that the worst place to be is in your nice modern car, made to the very highest possible engineering standards, meeting all European Union directives and regulations about quality. And even the poor cyclist who is struggling behind maybe a lorry and a diesel bus doesn't have the same degree of exposure to pollution as the smug person in the very modern expensive car. Now, the importance of this is this is a major public health issue. And it is well known, and it's been replicated in different parts of the world. Government ministers, back to rabbits, are very, very, very nervous. They, it's okay to say smoking will kill you. It's okay to say alcohol will kill you. But do I go on television or something and say, sitting in your car will kill you? Or some combination of, not necessarily kill you, but make you very ill. So we do have levels of scientific information that are in a no-go area. They shall not be communicated, and we do not want to alarm the proletariat so that they might get upset. Um, this kind of work is repeated all over the world. Physical inactivity, they're popping up next to tobacco in terms of the burden, the physical burden, disability life years, the, the physical burden of disease and illness in society. 
If you trot down that list and look at things that people do like to talk about a lot, unsafe sex, occupational hazards, illicit drugs, cholesterol, obesity, and then you get physical inactivity. So anyone involved in transport or public health should have a very strong agenda for doing something to increase levels of physical activity in society. And that has actually gone very well in recent years in terms of level of awareness and debate and what we need to do with walking and cycling and accessibility and local services and local facilities. But we don't have the will and we don't have the integrated holistic thinking necessary to re-engineer our cities so that for example, it is physically possible and rewarding and nurturing and encouraging to make contact with our local shops, our local post offices. By the way, we've just closed 3,000 local post offices in England, so we have made post offices further away, and there is a clear modal shift away from walking and cycling to the car because of that. And physical inactivity is a killer, and we need to get to grips with that in a, the widest public health sense. Percentage of children driven to school by car, this is the kind of work I mentioned earlier in one false move and you're dead, but there's a very interesting dimension to this work which is the international uh, comparison dimension. Uh, we're currently trying to repeat this project in England, Germany and Australia and there you see the Germany uh, with the, the left hand of the three columns actually having quite low levels of percent of children driven to school by car, though that's 1990s, which is why we want to do the work again next year <clears throat> in 2010. England, uh, why do Brits take their kids to school by car far more intensively than do the Germans? And it's a very interesting question. From a social science point of view, it's a bit tricky to answer, but the Australians are even worse, and we have to get to grips with the international comparisons. Obesity, we are told constantly by public health professionals and others, we have an obesity epidemic, we're going to be spending £50 billion per annum by whatever it is, 2030, 2050, and yet the integrated holistic thinking needed to deal with obesity, which means getting to grips with transport. It doesn't mean getting to grips with organised sport, it doesn't mean getting to grips with Olympics. I was recently accused at a meeting with government ministers of, of, of saying I wanted the Olympics scrapped because I was arguing that I wanted that money spent on cycling and walking facilities in every locality in, in the United Kingdom. But we're not going to get, grips with the, with the, uh, to, get to grips with obesity until we recognise the detailed ways in which we can encourage higher levels of physical activity right down to number 32 Acacia Avenue. Uh, this is, of course, a, a, this is like a test of whether you're paying attention or not. It is a rigged diagram in that it is designed to show what I want it to show uh, because, because the countries are simply ranked, but the numbers are accurate. Uh, uh, the numbers, you look at the percentage of obesity and the percent of walk, cycle and public transit there, so what, what percentage of the population is walking, cycling and using public transport. So let's go immediately to the goody goodies, not Sweden, in spite of the fact that I work with the Stockholm Environment Institute, uh, but Denmark, but Sweden's very near to Denmark, I'm sure the Swedes would argue the Danes copied off them anyway. So there you see, uh, the, let's go to the good end, Denmark, right at the good end there, where we've got 55% um, of all the trips our walk, cycle and public transport and the obesity, the percent obesity level is what, banging around maybe around 18%. And then if we go to the bad end, the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, you get the opposite way around. And in terms of obesity, by the way, it's always the United States, Australia and the United Kingdom that just kind of swap places in the top three. And why? Why do they do that? And we need to think of that. Now, even more seriously, oil and war... Uh, I'm going to have to pass over this very quickly. This is a big subject, to put it at its mildest. Um, in terms of increasing scarcity of oil supplies, peak oil, um, the rising global demand for oil, and the evidence, which is contentious, but it is there, the evidence that we are actually facing a decline in new oil discoveries and the availability of oil, naturally, minds are turning to the ways in which we can use military force to nick it and hang on to it, um, because we don't really want China and India to get to a situation where they can have more oil than we deserve ourselves. So this is just one of many quotes 
uh, from US military Pentagon type discussions. Basically, we must start thinking in terms of using military power to uh, commandeer uh, available supplies of oil globally. That's pretty bad news, actually, but uh, we may return to that later in question time. Uh, okay. This is the peak oil point. This is from um, uh, a study carried out by two Canadians using International Energy Agency data and looking at the relationship between the projected consumption, demand for oil in what's called the IEA reference scenario, always very attractive terminology, uh, going up there to the top right by 2030, and production. This is billions of barrels per year. Now, when you start looking at graphs like that, even rabbits ought to realize that there's something funny going on. Uh, now, the, the predicted increase in consumption may, of course, change. The thing about predictions to 2030, it's possibly not going to happen in the way that this diagram shows. But there's a very serious problem that we tend to call peak oil, and there's a very easy solution, which is decarbonizing the economy and moving to zero carbon. This is all dealt with in this... Uh, uh, absolutely fascinating book, Transport Revolutions, Moving People and Freight Without Oil. Uh, Sweden has adopted its own approach, putting in a plug once again for, in a sense, the uh, sponsors of the Stockholm Environment Institute, uh, making Sweden an oil-free society. Not entirely without problems, but there are lots of signs of clear thinking at the national level in Sweden on this matter, which are absent in the United Kingdom. My favourite Australian road sign, which indicates, I think, what we are now facing. We are doing things wrong, and we need to change our mind. Uh, I always like to acknowledge that I stole this from Sustrans, the National Cycling uh, Network organisation. Uh, so I'm now moving into the final part, you'll be glad to hear, and relatively quickly. Uh, what do we, I've said it's easy. What do we do about all this? How do we put everything right? Well, we could have a process of basilization, right? Uh, Basel in Switzerland, very wealthy, very successful, lots of, lots of American multinational pharmaceutical and chemical companies. In other words, it, 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 it sends all the right signals in terms of economically successful, and that matters in this kind of debate. Why does Basel manage to get 21% of all its trips every day by cycling, and Nottingham 1.6%? Interestingly, your university is an absolutely wonderful place with 25% of all its trips every day by bicycle, which is amazing. It puts it, we forget those minor places like Oxford and Cambridge, but York is actually at the top of all the real places, excluding those minor ones. And that's because of real policy. That's real policy over probably 20 years or more. So we need to do what Basel has done, and I don't have time to tell you exactly. Even the basilization idea has been reproduced by the OECD. This is OECD data, another attractive acronym, EST3, Environmentally Sustainable Transport Version 3 Scenario. So the OECD3 scenario says that we, if we don't do very much intelligent stuff, we'll have 76% increase in our traffic levels, and that goes almost exactly the same way for CO2. And if we do a number of things, and they say here are the 84 things you need to do, we will bring that down in the way you see there, so we'll have a 23% increase, which is a big change. Having done our basilization, we can do our vorbanization. Vorban is a suburb of Freiburg in southern Germany. Freiburg claims to be the eco-city par excellence, the solar city par excellence. Everything that they do in Freiburg looks really good. Uh, Vauban is a new residential suburb, 5,000 people. It has its own tram route. Uh, the city planners said that before anyone moved in, the tram route had to be up and running, a concept that British traffic planners are unaware of, that you should be able to sort out transport before people move in. We move 5,000 people into residential estates um, on the edge of cities and build them three parking places each and no buses and no trams, and three years later we put a leaflet through the door saying, have you thought of using the bus? Um, that is very intelligent. So Vauban is a very successful residential suburb. And there's lots of best practice, lots and lots and lots of best practice around the world. Cycling in Munster, 36% of all the trips every day in Munster are by bicycle. Basel, we talked about. Urban logistics, 60% reduction in lorry miles per day in 
five German cities doing urban logistics, congestion charging, even in London and Stockholm, that works. Oil-free Sweden, car reduced, Lund, Freiburg. Lund is a, uh, a pretty small town in southern Sweden, which has a very successful policy of reducing car use in the city. Rural public transport, um, Freiburg, uh, mainly through speed limitation and decommissioning parking places, great successes. Uh, we mustn't forget rural transport. Rural transport is very important. This is a particular example. There are many such examples in the state of North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany. The Burger Bus, a citizen's bus. Basically, even the German planners got fed up of rural dwellers saying uh, that they didn't have enough buses. So what they did is give them a bus and give them a computer and train somebody, do the insurance, do the maintenance, and say, right, and there are 60 schemes now running. So small, grumpy villages in North Rhine-Westphalia get given their own bus and said, stop whinging, just sort it out yourself. You know, you do the timetable. But you must make it connect with the following trains, the following buses, the following, and so on. And that's worked very well to sort out rural transport. Um, in the Stockholm Environment Institute, we have a project <coughs> called the Zero Carbon Project. And this is something we're currently working on at the moment. And this is to design a zero-carbon transport system for the United Kingdom by 2050. We're doing calculations of the amount of carbon we can strip out of the system. We have a very sophisticated technique called the salami technique, uh, which basically means that we say, OK, uh, what can we get out of this with congestion charging, with cycling, with getting people on buses, uh, with uh, taxation and so on. So we're collecting all that together with fiscal, behavioural, spatial and technology, stealing ideas from the Germans about uh, the, a federal programme in Germany called Creating the City of Short Distances. So how do we pull all that together? We're producing a hybrid approach combining elements of those four different uh, approaches and then identifying policy pathways. We are designing a zero carbon transport system and we've been told that we have to get the main answers out by the first week in June. So we'll, <coughs> we'll let you know. What if it doesn't work? What if we can't get to our zero carbon transport future through science, through modelling, through scenarios, all the work we do? We think we can. It might not be zero carbon. I think it might be 92.5% carbon reduction, but okay. Now, if we can't get there, then I'm going to go back to uh, an approach I learned from this character, Professor Hermann Knopflacher of the Technical University of Vienna. Uh, he's been talking uh, to the Austrian government for many years, and this is him outside the Ministry of Transport of Austria in Vienna. <clears throat> and he says that really they don't listen very well, so he wants to produce a clear image uh, of what life will be like if pedestrians behave like cars. So when he goes to meetings, that's what he does. Right? <laughs> and he does. I've seen him. He does it. And he wanders around. He wanders around the ring road of Vienna and, and uh, says hello. Uh, some motorists wind down the window and say rude things, but he, he speaks to them nicely because he's a transport professional and we're all very nice. So he talks to them. Then he parks. <laughs> and he actually puts money in a meter as well and puts the little parking sticker on. on and, and he explains to people that this is what Vienna would be like if everybody behaved as a car. Please behave differently. Behave like a pedestrian, not like a car. And then he gets his transport students... Uh, <laughs> I, I think my employers in the University of York might have a problem if I decided to take 50 undergraduates of York University around a particular part of York's highway system in this way, so I haven't yet thought of that. And he takes them around, and it is actually causing a great deal of interest and is bringing about uh, changes in the way that Vienna is planned. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. That was really wide-ranging and very interesting. Uh, we've got a few minutes for questions, so I'll ask for your response and your questions. Uh, isn't one of the problems we've got democracy? Um, <laughs> <laughs> as we've seen in Manchester, people yeah. <clears> have <throat> choice parties, so perhaps they're not very um, well-constructed choice, and they aren't very educated, and they are uh, open to bias and mm -hmm. etc., Government ministers have a very short two, three, five year horizon, mm. and lots of things will do transport take 15, 20 years to happen. And so it's like Turkey going to the Christmas, 
it's very difficult to get someone to put in the policy if they know we'll get them out of office in three years prior to being able to I'm sure you've hit uh, the nail on the head with one of the, prob one of the many problems, but I think your, your opening remark was incorrect. I don't think we do have democracy, actually. Um, but that's another story. The, in terms of what we're trying to do, at the moment, the default option is the car. So it's not, it's not constructing a vision of a new society where people can't use a car, and this is the essential point that most of us are trying to get over. It's not a case of the fat controller or whatever saying, you know, you must not use a car and you must cycle. Uh, from Selby to York, and that's it, and do your, your Tesco shopping and then cycle back with it. You know, it's not like that at all. It's about saying there shall be a range of options. And in the German context, and this is part of the basalization thing, uh, it's quite simple. There are trains, there are trams, there are buses, there are car share cars, car club cars, uh, personally owned cars. You know, uh, you're looking at six or seven choices. So you're right. Uh, in, in what you've identified as a sort of a nervousness on the part of politicians. But we all need to think a lot more clearly about how we shift that mindset towards what we want is a more choice-rich environment. So the default option is not the car. There are many options, and then you choose. So I need your good ideas on that. Uh, yes, um, you haven't said much about electric transport. I know that we need new yeah. energy <clears throat> generators, electric things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as, as you uh, point out, there is one strand. When I very briefly referred to technology in, that, in the, one of those slides, uh, electric vehicles pretty high, is pretty high on the list of technological approaches to producing zero carbon or low carbon futures. They exist um, at the moment. They're very expensive, but they will be around by 2050, we are assuming, in some shape or form. Uh, a lot of the potential impact depends upon the electricity mix uh, and there seems to be some confusion about that. So what will we be using to generate our electricity by 2050? And then that, in, in its turn, will inform the answer in, in terms of what contribution electric vehicles can make. But there are a couple of like, worrying things going on as well. A vehicle uses one-sixth of its lifetime energy use in its manufacturing, the vehicle itself is also associated with uh, these other things I've been trying to talk about, you know, road safety um, and space and, and so on and all those different things. When I taught transport, I had a, uh, a, a slide which I've spared you this evening where there is a, uh, an elderly lady dying on the streets of London saying, thank God I was run over by an environmentally friendly vehicle. You know, in other words, there are a lot of other problems uh, which the electric vehicle won't solve the road safety world are getting concerned about electric vehicles because they think they're a bit quiet and think that that in its turn will lead to uh, a little bit of a, a bite back. They're part of the mix. Uh, all, all we would say, I guess, in, in the team working on this in the Stockholm Environment Institute is that they are part of the mix, but we must look at the fiscal, the behavioural, the choice rich, the spatial. You know, for example, if you could imagine a community where people really can walk and cycle and use public transport to carry out the majority of their everyday tasks, then to what extent does that change the demand level for the car? Over, you know, and move, moving through it with a different set of scenarios is what we're trying to do. It's not ignored. I just want to add to that point as well. Like at the minute, under the current uh, fuel mix, yeah. you know, the UK's electricity, electric cars should be used electric cars. They should actually be called coal-powered cars because you have to burn a load of yeah. coal. And that is in fact the most polluting of all mm -hmm. fuels. So the first priority must be to reduce the demand or prevent an increase in demand yeah. for its electricity consumption <coughs> until the point where you get a, a large penetration of renewables. And I, mm -hmm. I just wanted to come back to the, the time scale issue yeah. because um, I read quite a lot about um, uh, peak oil. Yeah. Basically, it peaked in uh, July 2008, according to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, that gives a real sense of urgency to what we need to do, and uh, I'm just wondering, I mean, I see it as basically a decade where you have to use the mm -hmm. remaining uh, resources that we have to mm -hmm. construct, um, mm -hmm. you know, a, a sustainable economy, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering how can you get that sense of urgency mm -hmm. across, because I see it basically as a mm -hmm. World War II mobilisation. Mm. 
I think you're quite right about the degree of urgency and, and the use of the word mobilisation, but um, the, the signs are that that has not yet reached those people that will be primarily involved in uh, national level uh, in, in making the changes that need to be made, because the changes are, are largely budgetary. You know, what, what, what are we going to spend our money on? I mean, for example, I'm involved with one bypass in another part of the country, four miles of road, where government has said we'll spend £140 million on building four miles of road. And there's a large number of things you can do with £140 million, which would give us a better chance of dealing with this problem. And again, in the Stockholm Environment Institute, we're, we often discuss resilience. What this is about is making cities, regions, rural areas, societies more resilient. It's not about telling people what to do, but we have to be ready to adapt to some fairly significant and in some cases nasty changes. So all we can do is keep talking about it and talk it up. And there are other bigger things going on that I've deliberately excluded from the talk this evening because there's just too much, which is carbon rationing and personal carbon trading. So one of the ideas, for example, is that we could all be given uh, a, a, a quota. You know, you, you can have 10 tonnes of CO2. And then when it's, when it's exhausted, that's it, depending who you talk to, you know, you can... You, choose whichever one of the following would apply to you. You don't use a car, you don't eat, you, you don't go on holiday, you don't fly. You know, uh, so this, this is another circuit of the, of the discussion. But in terms of the urgency and then the degree of mobilisation that's necessary, I entirely agree with you, and those discussions are going on, but not very productively in this country. One more quick question. Uh, yes, there's, there's a, a city in Kent. Uh, yeah? And I, I've really forgot which one is, could be Ashford or somewhere, uh, where they've taken away all the road marks. Oh, yeah. Mm. I'm just wondering whether you'd like to comment on that as, as a... Yeah? I don't know much about it. Uh, I'm not sure where the, the Kent place is, but this is the um, Hans Mondeman approach, uh, a Dutch traffic engineer, which says clear away all the clutter. It's been done in Kensington High Street. Get rid of the traffic lights, get rid of zebra crossings, pedestrian crossings, get rid of railings and, and so on. And it's very popular in Germany and in the Netherlands, of course. And the idea is that you create a new uh, context where people negotiate with each other and eyeball with each other and you produce a, a more friendly uh, environment, especially in the city, so that the so-called, what do you want to call them, slow modes or sustainable modes or physically active modes become more likely to, to take off. Um, what I've read about it and what I've seen in other parts of the world is it, it sounds really great. British traffic engineers are a bit nervous of, of doing it in the sense that, you know, it's the usual debate we would have in Britain and we need to somehow uh, close that debate. You know, uh, will it produce a lot more dead bodies in the short term kind of debate? But the evidence from these places that have adopted it on a larger scale in other countries is that it works really well. We have to re-engineer our cities, our physical environment, to make the streets much more people-friendly and less dominated by the car. You know, one tonne of metal carrying a person weighing 75 kilos is not good physics. So we have to change. And we're in the physics building, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. I'll hand over to you. <laughs> So good evening. I'm uh, Johan Schielen Chair, and I'm going to give a, a vote of thanks to John Whiteleg. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of the Stockholm Environment Institute Centre here in the University of York. We're formerly part of the biology department, um, but we have linkages with departments across campus. Um, I would like to very warmly thank John for his very engaging talk. It's, it's very timely. Um, John has been with us since about 2002, and he's always provided us with lots of ideas, rather sort of radical ideas um, in many people's eyes, um, but new and exciting ways to view sustainability um, and inform a sustainability debate. And transport is a major cause of all of the environment and development problems across the world that we, we um, have to deal with. And we're very pleased that John has chosen to work with us and this zero carbon project, I think, will be very exciting. Um, so uh, it's very timely that he gave this talk and I just want to share with you a couple of brief insights which illustrate how important it is to address these, these uh, transport puzzles. Um, 
I listened um, the other month to Nick Stern when he was giving a, a, a talk at the opening of the Climate Change Economics and Policy Center at the University of Leeds. And he said that um, talking about this goal of the 80% reduction of greenhouse gases um, by 2050, he said that the UK can do this. All it has to do is deco uh, totally decarbonize the transport and electricity generation systems, and then that's fine. Um, then we'd just about be able to make it. So that's all we have to do. So um, that's, um, And the other is, last week I was invited to go to Tehran to... Um, uh, the mayor's office invited to talk about air pollution and its relation to transport, um, the, the, the transport, the impacts, and integrated assessment. And we were shown, shown around this transport centre. I mean, Iran is not a developing country. I would call it a country in transition. And it, there was a, a room about this size with two huge screens, about 20 by 20 foot, with with um, views of every single traffic intersection across the whole of Tehran with cameras that they could look and look at all the traffic jams, basically. And they are trying desperately to solve their transport problems, and um, they're, they're putting in a bus rapid transit system, they're trying to build out their metro. And, and I said, well, you know, with all this sophisticated um, stuff, you know, can you see any difference? And they said, well, it's a bit difficult because last year, um, we had 700,000 new cars added to the roads of Tehran, so any improvement is swamped by this massive increase in, in uh, transport. So, I mean, we've certainly not solved any of the transport problems in this country. Um, it is true that other countries, such as Sweden, do seem to be a bit more proactive. Um, all the buses in Sweden seem to work on biogas. It's sort of like one of those tomorrow's world things in the uh, UK. Um, and um, we're creating some really massive problems throughout the world. It's very important that researchers such as John Whiteleg um, provoke us into assertive action. And John has been considered a bit of radical when it comes to transport policy, but it's, it's clear to me at least that radical policies are, are totally required. And so therefore I, I really thank you, John, for the insights you've given us today. Um, and... Um, and I hope that you continue to provoke us and provoke others and provoke ministers and, and try and get the rabbits to sort of uh, you know, jump out of the way of the uh, lights and, and uh, start thinking constructively. Um, and then finally, I'd just like to thank also the Communications Office um, for organising this lecture and the, the invitations and also the Vice-Chancellor's Office for, for their help in organising this event. And, and very finally, I'd like to invite everyone here to um, join... Professor John Whiteleg, um, and um, harangue him with further questions about how to save the world. Um, outside, um, there are some nibbles and drinks. So thank you very much, John.